All right. Um, good morning. Uh, thank you for attending my presentation today. Uh, my name is Jason Cox, and I'm an application system analyst for Tallahassee Land County GIS. Uh, I'm excited to share with you uh, my dive into using deep learning tools in ArcGIS Pro. So today, I'll share my experience using uh, ESRI's image analyst extension uh, for automating pixel classification to identify parking lot lanes in Leon County. My hope is by the end of this presentation, you'll see how easy it is for a GIS professional to utilize the powerful tools available in ESRI's image analyst extension. Uh, you don't have to be a math whiz or even write any code um, to use the geoprocessing tools. Um, once I'm done with my slideshow, um, if I have time, I will uh, crack open um, a, a Jupyter notebook in Google Colab and uh, run through some um, uh, classification outside of uh, ArcGIS Pro. Uh, so that'll be fun as well. Okay. So the problem I want to solve. Given a set of imagery, I want to find a way to extract information without the need for hours and hours of manual labor. So computer, computer vision tasks or computer vision algorithms enable the computer to process this visual data and extract information. So the goal is to translate raw pixels into a form recognizable by humans. So deep learning methods use artificial neural network architectures to solve these problems. The deep and deep learning simply refers to the number of hidden layers in an artificial neural network. <clears throat> and uh, here we have a uh, diagram where uh, we, in a nutshell, um, the architecture shows that you have an input and you need to make a prediction um, and provide some sort of output. So each algorithm, algorithm in the model hierarchy applies a, a transformation to the data and learns from a, a prediction, either right or wrong, and uses back propagation. And I could go into a lot of detail making explanation. But in short, um, what we have is a kind of automated method using these artificial neural networks of uh, making predictions and then um, providing output based on your um, input layers. Okay. So um, in ArcGIS Pro, there is an extension. Um, it does cost um, uh, money. It is not free. It's the image analyst extension. Um, but it does, as I said earlier, um, allow you to uh, utilize deep learning um, um, on your desktop. So uh, the first thing to note is that um, you can utilize your GPU um, for running these tools, which is um, very important if you're running um, your um, model on large data sets, which uh, more than likely if you're using kind of imagery, you know, classify pixels or detect objects, that's the case. You don't want to be running this for weeks on weeks using the CPU. So that's, that's great that that's well integrated. Uh, you can uh, train models and then you can save your models and um, you can reuse them. Um, and it is a one stop shop um, for like end to end uh, training and then um, exporting um, your trained models. So it's a, it's a very useful tool. Okay, so how do I implement deep learning in ArcGIS Pro? So installing the deep learning frameworks is really easy. Um, you will want to make sure that you download the correct libraries for your specific version of Pro. Uh, when you update your specific version of ArcGIS Pro, you also need to download the latest uh, deep learning frameworks. The Python packages will be installed to the default um, ArcGIS Pro Python 3 environment. Uh, so any clone of the default will contain those deep learning frameworks. So you don't have to go and clone your environment and kind of update the packages. Um, it will be installed to your default. ESRI does recommend a GPU with at least eight gigabytes of uh, VRAM, um, but honestly, you probably need quite a bit more if you're doing any um, sort of uh, um, beefy analysis. Um, you don't want, like I said, to be running anything for you know weeks. Um, you must be better served by running for hours. Um, 
So you do need an NVIDIA card, um, and it does need to have a CUDA compute capability. And what that means is essentially it allows the um, uh, processing use the, using the uh, GPU uh, for those specific uh, tools in the image analyst extension. And um, this is the link uh, at the bottom here um, to the uh, GitHub page uh, to install those deep learning frameworks um, and uh, any other kind of documentation that you need to read through. But honestly, installing is really easy. You just go to that link, um, figure out what version of Pro you have, and then you just kind of run the download. Okay. So uh, for a number of years, um, we have wanted to create a data set of parking lot lanes um, slash connectivity lanes to use in our base map products. Um, this data set would serve the purpose of enhancing our base maps by providing additional content um, and context on commercial parcels and areas, um, say like apartment complexes um, and any place that there is um, kind of paths that you know emergency services slash public safety could take that would be useful for them. Okay. Uh, we additionally could provide this information to our um, community maps project. Um, as you may be familiar with Google Maps, um, when you kind of zoom into a specific scale, you will be giving the information for those parking lot lanes as you see in this image. Um, that's kind of the standard of kind of what they look like in Google Maps. You'll see like the uh, vector line work um, and kind of the uh, darker gray shade against the base map. Um, and currently in, in our base maps, we don't have any of that context. Um, and I wanted to find a way um, to produce that type of data um, without having to um, go through like hours and hours of manual labor. Uh, so I figured I could, hey, let's see if I can utilize the um, kind of uh, deep learning tools in Pro um, to kind of to automate that process. Okay. Uh, upon researching um, this issue, um, I found a sample Jupyter notebook uh, for um, automatic road extraction using deep learning um, on the RTIS API for Python on the ESRI developer site. So that's that's great. So I knew then that, okay, I don't have to start from scratch. There's already a kind of model slash architecture out there that I can uh, build on. Um, so this model has already been created for the multitask road extractor. So I see that, okay, this model is used to extract roads. If it's used to extract roads, I could potentially use that to extract parking lot lanes instead of street center lines. Uh, so the multitask road extractor model would be useful to me because it utilizes orientation learning, uh, which allows the identification of features at specific orientations. So not only do you kind of take into fact the kind of pixel value itself, uh, but the orientation of the pixels in a specific image. So this would allow for the extraction of a uh, topologically connected uh, road network or parking lot lane in my instance. So um, as I said, this is great because I don't have to create anything from scratch. Okay. Because I don't have vector data uh, representing uh, parking lot lanes currently um, to train the model on, um, I just need to create my own set of sample data. Um, so what I'll do first is I'll identify a few different parking lots to train on, um, and I'll try to find areas that kind of uh, differ in uh, color and like arrangement, just like so a few different sample types. As you see in the image here, um, I have kind of three input mask polygons. Uh, and then um, in blue, I have drawn in uh, center line, uh, polyline line data for the parking lot lanes that I would want to train on. Uh, now that I have other training samples, um, this is just kind of like three little areas that I provided um, to uh, train on. So it's as simple as that. You have kind of your areas of interest in your sample data. Now, you don't necessarily have to use the kind of bounding input mask polygons. Um, you can use, if you go into environments on the tool itself, use like a specific uh, map extent. Um, but I just find it easier to um, have uh, constraints on uh, what I provide the tool. So this is a view of the export training data for deep learning tool. Um, so the first step, um, is using this uh, tool to utilize deep learning is exporting your uh, sample data. Uh, so 
what I'll use is the 2021 imagery as my input raster uh, and designate a folder uh, to save my uh, training data, my input chips. And I will use a sample of my parking lot lanes I created as input features and my input mask polygons I created to limit the areas in which image chips get created. Um, as we see, our buffer radius is 10. Um, so when I created the data, I created uh, polyline data. However, to um, use the metadata format classified tiles, um, I'll need to um, create a buffer radius to actually create uh, pixels because I'm not actually feeding it um, vector data, I'm gonna feed it uh, pixel data. So I'm essentially creating a, a width uh, to the, my vector data um, for the pixels that represent parking lot lanes. So um, what we're gonna do next is we're gonna train that deep learning model. And this is essentially just taking that file that directory that got saved from the export training data for deep learning tool. So I'm gonna set my input training data as input. You can set the number of epics you wanna train on. I have um, set as kind of my default I usually go with when I um, kind of perform tests as 20. Um, now you, depending on kind of what you find as you can iterate through your training, you may start lower, you may start higher. Uh, but the great thing about this tool is on the validation, you can actually stop the model um, when it stops improving. So if I set my epics as 20, but it stops improving after 10 epics, um, the tool will allow it to go ahead and stop that and freeze that model after 10 epics instead of going through 20. So that's the great thing about the tool is that's already kind of built in there for you. You just have to make sure that you set that uh, parameter. So I will point my model type to the multitask road extractor. And you'll see that um, kind of the parentheses there, it's pixel classification, because that's taking uh, uh, rasters. Um, and that's why when I set the uh, model output, I set it to uh, pixel classification. And the, the other great thing about using the uh, trained deep learning model is that you can go in and um, normally when you're using kind of standalone or you're kind of creating from scratch um, these uh, deep learning models, you'll have to go and kind of figure out what that learning rate is. Uh, now, the great thing about the way that this uh, uh, tool is written is that you can leave that blank and it will automatically calculate the best learning rate for you. So as I said, uh, the, the team at Esri made this really as kind of simple as possible to go in and like for a non kind of uh, professional in the, the world of deep learning kind of just really um, get in and kind of get your hands dirty without having to kind of mess with a lot of the uh, hyper parameters. All right. So the one of the most important things you want to do is um, when you uh, start um, using this tool, the train deep learning model, um, is that you go into the environments tab and you switch over the processor, processor type from CPU to GPU and that will allow that uh, GPU processing uh, running this specific tool. In addition to the um, model, uh, the trained model that gets saved as your output, you'll, um, that'll get saved as a, either as a .emd or a .dlpk, so deep learning package file. Um, you also get a HTML document um, showing you your model metrics um, that include a loss graph and performance samples. And so you'll see in the loss graph that um, my uh, training and validation um, is um, looking um, like it's supposed to. There's kind of no, no weird spikes and does perform pretty well. However, you'll see that the um, uh, model does uh, overfit the training set as opposed to the validation set. And once again, because of the tool that's already kind of broken down for you, you don't have to go in and kind of set aside training and validation sets. Um, that can all be done within that um, that tool itself. So like I said, easy, really easy. And then you'll see the performance samples, the, the ground truth first predictions. So you'll see the how my vector um, line work was kind of um, transformed into pixels. And you'll see um, that ground truth uh, pixel versus the predictions of the model. So all in all, it looks pretty good. And I like the, the output there. All right, so then I wanna run the training model. Uh, so I will use the classified pixels using deep learning tool. 
So I'll set the input raster as my 2021 imagery. I'll set the location of my output raster, and I'll just point to that model that um, I trained in that previous step. And then here we see that uh, .dlpk. All right. So in the imagery here, you'll see the output of that model. Um, kind of in beige, you'll see the, the classified pixels. Um, and then our kind of street center line is um, kind of that blue vector data in the background. Um, and here we have the uh, shopping complex, complex here um, off of Mayhem. This is kind of the Walmart and um, the, the Costco area. Um, so kind of Falls Chase commercial complex. Um, all in all, it, it's pretty well. Um, it's, it's not great. You see there's some kind of gaps there, um, but we'll go take a deeper dive um, into the results. So this close-up view shows how certain pixels weren't classified correctly. Um, you'll see that there could be potential issues due to uh, shadows in the imagery or kind of the painted stock text on the ground um, that kind of caused issues with classification. Um, I think you know part of the reason with that is the, the training samples that I provided uh, I probably didn't uh, provide enough training samples where you have kind of that uh, the painted words on the ground um, and there's not enough with like shadows in the imagery or as I um, come to find later, because there's like tree coverage that um, uh, it's kind of making the model not run as well because I didn't provide enough samples with uh, tree coverage and the shadows that those trees cause. All right, uh, at this stage, um, I have ran the automatic road extraction um, using deep learning documentation. Um, that's kind of the extent of um, what ESRI has provided. Uh, but I have pixels um, and I don't want pixels. I don't want raster data. I want vector data parking lot lines. Um, and there's no documentation that I found on that. So it's kind of like uncharted territory. What do I do now? Um, I thought I would just be able to use raster to polyline. Um, however, that did not actually create the line work I wanted. It created line work for each pixel in the output raster, which was not ideal. Um, so each pixel had its own line. So that's not really usable. So um, I need to create the data I want from the data I have. Okay. The first geoprocessing tool I ran across that I saw, thought would solve the problem was the FIN tool. Um, as the name suggests, FIN rasterizes the linear features by shrinking the number of cells representing the width of the features. So kind of shrink the width, essentially. Um, that did not work great, as you see in the image, um, based off of the raster data I have. You see kind of like those kind of spaghetti strands going out. Um, and that's definitely not something I want to clean up um, on my end through any sort of manual process. So what I thought of then was, OK, I need to kind of reduce the resolution. So I use the generalized tool on my raster data. Um, so um, to generalize, though, the first thing I want to do was resample. That's actually the tool after doing some search. OK, yeah, generalize, generalize. No, nah, it's resample. OK. Resample is what I need to actually kind of make larger pixels from my smaller pixels. So that would be my first step, is creating those uh, 3 by 3 uh, pixel size. As you see here, it kind of cleans up the boundaries a bit. OK, next step was to run boundary plane. Um, so that further smooths my raster data. So as we see uh, kind of the top left uh, imagery is kind of smoother kind of pixel boundaries than what you see on the right where there's kind of like more uh, uh, dips. Um, so it's uh, just a smoother uh, version. So uh, now running thin produces the raster data I want. So now I think I can run that uh, um, process to convert to polyline. All right, so yeah, it worked, looks better. Um, however, looking at the vector output, um, I'm not happy with how wobbly the line work looks. So it um, looks like additional cleanup is needed. At this point though, I'm not using any kind of raster kind of geoprocessing tool, but I'll be um, now using vector tool. So to clean up the polyline vector data, um, I found three geoprocessing tools useful. Uh, first, which is uh, generalized, which is absolutely necessary. Uh, then step two and three are kind of more optional, depending on um, how you kind of you can see your output when running those steps. Um, each of these tools will alter your input data, um, so make sure you make a copy um, if you deem that necessary. Okay, 
And the image to the right, um, you will see, um, I'm sorry, image to the left, you will see the um, improvements. Um, I got to switch around, I'm sorry. Image to the right is generalized data. And then, no, left is generalized, right is snap. Yep, OK. So you see how generalized um, kind of smoothed out the uh, wrinkles and the lines. And then um, on the right is snap. Um, you'll see kind of down where you have that crosswalk um, where there's kind of a break in the line work. Um, in the snap version, it snaps those lines together. However, there's like additional anomalies that get created when you run that snap. Um, so as I said, it's kind of up to you to determine if it's useful you, for you to run the um, Fensify, which adds kind of additional uh, vertices to your line work and then run the snap. Um, but for me, I found it easier just to uh, use generalize. Okay, and now I'm gonna show you kind of the results. So the image on the left shows an area where my model does a good job of identifying parking lot lanes, uh, where only uh, minor, minor uh, cleanup is necessary. Uh, and the image on the right shows where the, the model didn't do great. Um, so the reason for this is the parking lot lanes there in Doe Campbell Stadium have kind of perpendicular, kind of yellow um, kind of lane markers, um, which did not uh, get picked up in my kind of 10 foot boundary uh, within my uh, sample data. So it's picking up these kind of yellow lines that aren't in my sample data that's throwing it off saying, okay, these aren't parking lot lanes, so I'm finding something else in the, uh, the imagery that um, uh, doesn't qualify it. So had I provided a uh, sample uh, area from Doe Campbell Stadium, would have picked those up and would have classified those. Uh, another example on the left where you see the um, model does a good job of picking up those uh, parking lot lanes uh, for apartment complexes um, that are kind of clearly identifiable in the imagery. And on the right where it's not, where it's kind of more um, kind of government slash light industrial kind of uh, commercial and uh, parking lot lanes where the pixel um, values aren't necessarily kind of as smooth, kind of the, the pavement is um, uh, not being picked up um, and then classified as parking lot lanes in this instance. Uh, to recap, uh, the steps I use, um, the resample, boundary clean, thin, and raster to polyline, and then really the only necessary vector tool would be generalized. So an additional model uh, feature project I'm going to use is the pix to pix model to colorize our um, uh, aerial photographs, our black and white aerial photographs. I run some samples um, and um, very successful, as you see on the left, is our black and white photo. And on the right is our colorized photo using the pix to pix model. And that would be my next project. And as I said, these architectures are already built out and available to use within um, ArcGIS Pro with that image analyst extension. I'm not writing any of these architectures or creating these models from scratch. I'm simply providing input data and then um, being able to run those tools and providing this output, all within ArcGIS Pro. No, no scripting needed. All right, and um, some useful links, and I'm gonna go over a few of these um, uh, after the slideshow is over. Um, the Coursera Deep Learning Specialization, um, that is a really in-depth kind of college level type of course. Um, there is a cost involved. Um, that really does get down in and start from like the ground up, going through all kind of the, the math, the calculus involved um, using the um, artificial neural networks. Um, that was not my favorite course. Um, I much prefer the uh, Fast AI um, online course. That is a hit the ground running type of course where it's you don't start with a theory. You start with kind of playing around um, using um, neural network models. And then once you start playing around, it goes and talks about each different facet. And you can kind of learn the facets, different facets as you go. So if you um, aren't a big fan of calculus or kind of um, having to sit through math lectures, um, I'd say uh, go through the FAST uh, AI course. Um, and this is, those are both outside of the um, ESRI um, environment. Um, same with uh, Google Colab. Uh, Google Colab is actually a um, hosted environment to, for you to run Jupyter Notebooks and uh, utilize their GPU runtimes. Um, so if you don't have a powerful GPU on your computer, 
Um, you can utilize Google Colab um, and with Google Drive if you want to save any images or any of your documents uh, on Google Drive. Um, it, it is a great uh, a tool. I recommend it highly. And then there's always documentation on TensorFlow and PyTorch. Uh, and then if you're using EFRI products, um, the GeoAI blog is great. Uh, and then the uh, ArcGIS API for Python sample notebooks are excellent. Um, now, you will be using the Python API Jupyter notebooks and the um, uh, geoprocessing tools in ArcGIS Pro. And for most of us, um, this would be the place I would recommend going if you don't want to like go into a lot of the background of the uh, learning uh, neural network models. Um, definitely dig into those sample notebooks and you can uh, uh, start, you know, hit the ground running as soon as you, you know, check out a uh, uh, trial run of the um, tool. So um, definitely highly recommended. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pull up a notebook I have on Google Colab. Okay. So I'm going to start off showing you. So this is Google Colab. And if we take a look at my runtime, you'll see that I'm able to use GPU hardware accelerator. So this is a um, cloud GPU, not use, utilizing the GPU on my machine at all. So like I said, don't think that learning neural networks, deep learning, et cetera, the fact that you don't have a GP, GPU um, would set you back, not at all. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and um, run a few lines of code, kind of show you some fun stuff, um, and then show you kind of a practical application. So in this example I'm going to show you is like a simple dog classifier. And you'll actually get this. Um, this is kind of taken from kind of the fast um, AI uh, lesson and kind of spruced up a bit with um, some code that um, uh, I, I borrowed from uh, uh, GitHub. Um, and I'm going to um, let you know that the GitHub is a great place um, for people kind of explaining their own kind of models that they build or they have their own dive into um, using neural networks. So I'm going to go ahead and run this first line of code real quick. And this utilizes FastBook, which, as I said, is coming from the Fast AI. Um, this is essentially just allowing me to go in, instead of how to write multiple lines of code, go in and um, mount my Google Drive to my um, Jupyter Notebook here. It's going to take a few seconds. OK. And you'll see that you'll get a um, link to go to a URL um, to authenticate um, this um, application. So I'm going to push that over, <clears throat> sign in, copy and paste my off code. All right, now my Google Drive is mounted. And so I'm gonna go ahead and import from FastBook um, everything I need and then the widgets I need to show later. So um, as I said um, earlier from GitHub, um, there's a lot of useful um, work that people have done. In this case from uh, Joe Dockro, there's an image scraper um, used to get images from DuckDuckGo. So this is awesome. So I don't have to go in and kind of find kind of sample data. I can go and scrape using DuckDuckGo from work that someone else has already done. So by all means, explore GitHub. Good stuff. So that's going to install. Make sure any packages I need. OK. So now what I'm doing here is I'm going to go ahead and set up um, pads in Google Drive to um, certain uh, file locations. Um, for this example, say uh, three different dog types I want to search for in DuckDuckGo. Uh, Antonio Shepherd, St. Bernard, Short Hair Pointer. Uh, and then I want to create a uh, folder location on my Google Drive for each of those dogs in my what's up dog slash images directory. And I'm searching for 50 results for each.
Okay. And then you'll see the path of each of those files. And what I can do now using the, once again, useful tools by uh, Joe Dockerel, um, view those images that were downloaded and clean up any images that uh, don't look correct. So you can go through the pages and make sure your output is as expected. If not, you can select a little button delete to remove those from your sample data, which is, as I said, a great functionality um, that I didn't have to write myself. You're just repurposing the work of others. And that, that's a lot of work um, that you'll see that has been done in um, kind of deep learning neural networks. It's a lot of times some of the greatest stuff is created by um, hobbyists that just kind of love to explore. So um, by all means, um, just explore away. So um, I set my image paths once I've downloaded all my images. I want to make sure that there's no failed images. Verify that. And now using the fast AI data block, I'm going to feed in dogs into image category blocks. I'm going to get the image files I saved. I'm going to split the data into validation sets. And I'm going to get the labels. So the labels would be the type of dog and resize the image to make sure all the images are the same size. To be able to use deep learning tools, artificial neural networks, you need to make sure all your images are the same size. I run that. And I want to show a batch. And here we are. So here we see each image with its associated label. Um, and everything looks good. So I'm going to go ahead. And set up my images to um, randomly resize them to provide um, additional data sets. So as we see, all these images are kind of clean. Uh, and kind of, uh, kind of zoomed in at specific um, scales. Each is kind of a little bit different. Um, what you can do is you can use random resize crop to provide additional training sets and kind of zoom in on specific parts of the image, um, and, which just provides additional data sets for the model to work with. And so I'm using now um, the convolutional neural network learner, and I'm just pointing at um, the um, model architecture, the ResNet 18. So this is utilizing transfer learning because I'm not setting up my own layers. I'm using a um, pre-trained model and just cutting off the head, providing my own input data, which are these dogs. And um, I set my FX to 15, you'll see right here. So it's gonna run through these really quick. Now, what you should be seeing as the process goes along, you should see the train loss and the valid loss decrease as the uh, number of iterations increase. Now, you may see some weird spikes, but as long as the overall trend is going down, um, your model is performing pretty well. So then I can create a confusion matrix, which is showing me that I'm actually not getting any, any errors. All my dogs are actually pointing to the prediction versus actual values are, are matching up, um, which in a, I'd say in this specific example, um, yeah, that, that's to be expected. Those are pretty you know, clear cut dogs, but as you go into kind of more complex issues, you'll see that with the confusion matrix, you won't necessarily get a one-to-one -one match. Um, and then you can plot the top losses since there's no like top losses in this case. Um, I don't need to run that. Um, but then you can also run an image cleaner, kind of cleaning up any mistakes. I don't want to run that now. Um, but what you can do is then you can save that model um, as a pickle file. So we just run learn export. And this is, pickle file is just a serialized uh, Python object. 
and then I can uh, make some predictions. So um, I have my dog that I want to make the prediction on. Here's my dog, uh, Arnie. He's about one year old. He's an Anatolian Shepherd mix. Um, as you see, he's kind of destroyed my carpet, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, so I want to go ahead and make a prediction on Arnie. Run that. We'll see that um, it's predicted um, that Arnie is Anatolian Shepherd based on those three categories I have. And then you'll see this kind of uh, piece of um, output here, this tensor base. This is just showing the uh, uh, prediction. So from zero to one, um, the highest value um, gets uh, identified as uh, the prediction. In this case, it's Anatolian Shepherd, as we see uh, down here. Anatolian Shepherd is um, and then St. Bernard and Short Hair Pointer. So it's more most likely he's Anatolian Shepherd out of the three categories with Short Hair Pointer coming in second. Okay, so you might be asking yourself, okay, so why do I care about dogs if I'm looking at GIS? Okay. So what I'm going to show now is that this could be applied to not necessarily dogs, but to a specific problem that I thought of um, using kind of like uh, our kind of damage assessment um, kind of process that we have here at TLC GIS, where we're trying to identify like the houses that have damage on the roof. So if I go in and kind of run that same process, instead of a dog classifier uh, running a, a house classifier, and let me uh, go ahead and da, 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 interrupt execution, close that. And go ahead and start this runtime. Uh, and manage sessions, terminate, close. The only reason I didn't start uh, off with this uh, specific house damage classifier is because it would take you know, quite a bit more time to train uh, based off the number of images. So I'm just going to load the pickle file um, that way. Uh, it doesn't take about an hour to run through this process. <clears throat> so um, as this is running, does anyone have any questions slash comments? Hey Jason, uh, we do have one question from uh, William. Mm -hmm. uh, he's asking, uh, where can we go to look for models, samples, or notebooks to kickstart our projects? Yeah, the um, ArcGIS um, API for Python, um, the uh, sample notebooks will be a great place to go. Um, and I'll show you on that website here shortly. Make sure Ooh, you thank you. Okay, now I'm going to run down and load my pickle file. Okay, so now I have um, a, a file on my uh, Google Drive uh, for tree damage. Um, that I can run. I loaded the pickle. However, I'm not going to run that um, at the moment. I'll go ahead and use the widget capability in FastAI uh, to go ahead and show you what you can do. So I loaded the pickle. Say I want to upload a image to classify using that widget. I can upload this example and view that within uh, this notebook. And so we have a tree down on the roof. Run prediction. Generate output. So we see here prediction damage probability um, one. So that means, yes, there's most certainly damage based on the model on that roof. And so um, we can run additional code to create a widget. And you don't necessarily have to use a widget. You can go in, kind of like automate on a directory to make classifications. Create a widget that where you upload files and create classifications. So here's the second example: single-family home, no damage, uploaded, classified, no damage, probability 0.99%. And 
And then just to show you our other category, example three, a tree on the road. Classify that tree down, no damage, probability 96%. So all this is done, um, as I said, not really anything um, on my end creating the architectures from scratch, but um, kind of based off the work of other people and using kind of the fast AI and utilizing kind of the web scraper um, available through uh, GitHub. So um, as I was saying before, um, if I can do it, you can do it. If you have any interest, by, by all means, uh, dig right in. Um, and to answer that question about um, where to go um, to get sample notebooks, so Python, sample notebooks, and you can go into GIS analyst and data scientists. And as you kind of scroll through kind of all the kind of um, various examples you have, you will have um, kind of language of the specific uh, sample notebooks that use um, deep learning slash deep learning tools. So here, for example, you have detecting swimming pools using deep learning, uh, land cover classification using deep learning. Um, there's extracting building footprints that I've done, um, which is not using pixel classification, but uses um, uh, mask uh, RCNN. Um, there's road surface investigation. So yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch there that will kind of help you go through and learn all about the models that are used um, and oftentimes you don't have to create your own models. Um, the models are already there, um, but you just have to kind of download the um, uh, .dlpk and implement. So you, um, extracting building footprints, that's what I did. I didn't create my own um, set of sample data. I just went ahead and ran their model um, on our uh, set of imagery to um, export that data. So yeah, the, the, definitely ArcGIS API for Python if you want to start you know, working within um, the um, ArcGIS Pro slash ESRI uh, realm. Any other questions? Good All right, well, uh, thank you for uh, attending my presentation. I appreciate it. And um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, any questions or comments you want to have, and I appreciate you attending today. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jason. Um, for the conference, we'll be taking a, a quick break. Our next uh, event will start at one o'clock. Uh, we have our day two keynote. Um, it's a little later start time today as he's out in the West Coast. Um, thank you again, Jason, for your time. Thank you for all of our attendees today for coming to listen to another great talk. Uh, we'll see you at one o'clock.